afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the third 2022 Brain Matters webinar series, Local Research in Cognitive Impairment and Available Opportunities. My name is Dina Boone, Public Educator with the Alzheimer's Society Southwest Partners. I will be the MC and moderator for today's webinar. Susan Oster, another public educator with the Society and Hannah McAbey, one of our amazing volunteers, will be helping with the technical side of things and managing the chat box. They will also be supporting the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. At the Alzheimer's Society, our role is not only to provide programs and services to people who are going through the journey of dementia, but also to provide dementia education and to advocate for those living with cognitive disabilities. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping business to go over relating to the webinar experience. Please note that your cameras are off and microphones are muted for the webinar. This event is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on our website in the education zone approximately two weeks after the event. At the end of the presentation, we will have approximately 30 minutes for a moderated Q&A session. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible. During the presentation, if you think of a question for the panelists, please add them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of, you, of your screen as you see here. Once you click the Q&A icon, the box will open for you. If you would like to submit a question anonymously, please be sure to click the send anonymous box before clicking the send button. Any questions submitted prior to the webinar have been shared with the panelists. We have also enabled the upvote feature in Zoom, which allows people to see all questions being asked and to move the most popular questions to the top of the list. If you see a similar question posted by someone, you can simply vote on the question by clicking the thumbs up icon underneath the question as seen here. Once the icon is clicked, the question will move up the list. Should you have any technical concerns, please type them in the chat box. Susan or Hannah will be happy to assist you. To see the chat box, move your mouse around and you should see the Zoom controls appear on your screen. Once visible, just click on the chat icon and it will open. You can submit your comments in the chat box and they will only be seen by the panelists, which includes myself, Susan, Hannah, and Sarah. Since everyone's situation is unique, the information being provided in this presentation is for educational purposes only and not specific advice for your situation. Should you have any specific questions about your situation, please contact your family physician for advice. We now have the pleasure of welcoming our guest speaker, Sarah Best. Sarah is the Clinical Trials Research Manager for the Cognitive Clinical Research Group at Parkwood Institute. She graduated from the University of Waterloo with a degree in health science in 2006 and from McMaster University with a master's degree in health management in 2019. She has been working in the field of dementia research for the past 13 years. Sarah is also the Budget Officer for the Consortium of Canadian Centres for Clinical Cognitive Research and a member of the Platform Implementation Team for the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. And now, please welcome Sarah Best. Thank you for that welcome, um, and I'm excited to be here today. I'm just going to share my screen. I think uh, sorry, I got disconnected Sarah, there was, quickly. That's sorry, okay. that was my bad, my bad. I'm so sorry. I accidentally muted you myself. <laughs> no, that's fine. Apologies. 
Can you see my screen okay? Yes, totally. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, Sorry. okay wonderful. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so thanks everyone for joining this presentation today. I'm really excited um, to share with everyone the research that we're doing here in London. So uh, this particular talk will be on local research opportunities uh, in cognitive impairment. So uh, first off, I have no conflict of interest uh, to disclose. And I just want to go through some objectives for the talk today. So I'm hoping people can um, understand what research for cognitive impairment is, why, uh, learn why it's important to participate in research. Uh, we're going to define the different types of research projects, including observational studies and clinical trials, and explore how you can participate in research locally if you're interested. Okay, so first off, what is clinical research? Um, so it is a type of research involving participants, and um, it often includes um, studying medical treatments or experimental therapies. Um, clinical research can also include observational studies in which people are followed over a period of time to determine health outcomes. So clinical uh, research for cognitive impairment then obviously involves individuals with cognitive complaints. And currently Parkwood Institute located here in London is a leading academic uh, research center in Canada for cognitive clinical research. And we are recruiting for over 15 clinical trials at the moment. So we've got lots of things happening here locally. So why participate? Why should we participate in research? So 55 million people worldwide are living with dementia and this number is expected to rise to 139 million by 2050. So globally, there is a movement to find both effective uh, treatments and prevention strategies for cognitive impairment uh, through innovation and research. And developments in research for cognitive impairment can largely be accredited to the thousands of volunteers that have both um, participated in observational and clinical trials. So we really, really do need folks to participate in these trials to advance um, science. So I stole this little image here at the bottom of the screen from Google, just to kind of outline what observational studies are. And we'll talk about those opportunities first. So observational studies are where researchers observe individuals with a certain risk factor that have had a specific diagnostic test or that are taking specific treatments or interventions without changing um, what they're um, exposed to or assigning them to a particular group. So for example, if we take people who eat organically and people who don't eat organically, um, we can uh, follow them over time and then look at health, health assessments. And that would be an example of an observational study. Whereas on the right hand side, you can see um, what wouldn't be an observational study is if you took a group of people and then assigned them to either eat organically or not eat organically, and then to follow them up with health assessments. So as we move into talking about um, the different types of studies, I wanted to um, put up this image of the spectrum of cognitive decline. If anyone's watched um, Dr. Michael Bory talk, he uses this image and I have borrowed it from him. So thank you, Dr. Bory. Um, so as you can see, um, folks uh, can fall anywhere on this spectrum of cognitive decline. And there are different research projects that apply to different people throughout their journey. Um, in the bottom here, you can see that when, uh, if you look at folks that are over 65, 75% of those individuals will have, you know, normal age consistent loss or maybe some subjective complaints with the other 25% having mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And by the time you hit, um, by the time you look at individuals who are 85 and older, you have a third of people who have normal memory or subjective complaints a third of people who have mild cognitive impairment and a third of people who have dementia. Um, and so we're gonna talk about this and refer to this slide as we kind of go through this presentation. So the first uh, trial, observational trial that I wanna talk about is called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative um, Study called ADME. And we've been running this at Parkwood Institute since 2006. So folks in ADME um, at this point, um, we're looking for individuals who have MCI or um, early Alzheimer's disease between the ages of 55 and 90. And we're looking uh, for individuals who are agreeing to have some biomarker collections done. 
So lumbar punctures, which you can see here is the process by which we get a sample of um, your spinal fluid, uh, which can give us a lot of information about uh, different changes that might be happening in the brain. Um, PET imaging, MRI, MRI imaging, and um, collecting some lab samples. And these visits are happen happening annually for um, four to six years. And I can talk about um, some of the PET imaging and MRI imaging in the next couple of slides. So here is a slide of uh, an individual who's had several MRIs over time. And you can see that these types of observational st studies, um, we can actually see in the red here, some of the atrophy or the brain loss that's happened over time when you superimpose the images on top of each other. So these are the type of things that we'd be doing with the ADNI study, getting um, scans over time and being able to observe changes in the brain. Another type of imaging are PET scans. So this is when you go to an imaging center and you can actually have a compound injected um, and that then binds in your brain to certain protein abnormalities that we're gonna talk about. So here, this is for an amyloid scan, which is a protein abnormality in the brain for folks who have Alzheimer's disease. And you can see on the right-hand side that um, the colors red and orange are indicating that that compound has uh, bound to those proteins and it's a positive scan. So as we continue to follow folks since 2006, um, ADNI has moved through several phases of this study and we continue to look into even ADNI 4. So recruiting more individuals who are willing to have some of these scans and assessments done at Parkwood. Um, and ADNI 4 is changing their focus a little bit. We're really hoping to reach out and try to get some folks from minority backgrounds and increase diversity within some of these research programs. So stay tuned, more uh, to come for the um, ADNI 4 program. Next, I wanna take a minute to talk about the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. So this is really a research strategy to accelerate discovery, innovation, and adapt new knowledge directed at prevention, treatment, and management of neurodegeneration with the overall goal to improve the quality of life of Canadians living with neurodegenerative diseases. So out of this initiative, I've highlighted two studies that are circled here in red that are part of this um, strategy that we'll be recruiting participants for at Parkwood. One of them is the Compass ND study, and one of them is called Can Thumbs Up, and we'll talk about how you can get involved in those studies. So Compass ND, we're looking for folks who have normal cognition, who might have some subjective complaints or have Alzheimer's disease, and they'll come into Parkwood and they'll have some cognitive assessments. We'll ask you some health questionnaires. You'll see um, a, neuro a, a geriatrician or a cognitive neurologist for a neurological exam. You'll be booked for an MRI scan and you'll have some lab sampling, and then we'll redo some of these assessments again at the two year mark. Uh, in addition to having these, you will also have the option to have an LP. Um, and we're uh, teamed up with um, some researchers, researchers in Canada um, that'll actually uh, be able to give some personalized results on some of those, um, uh, the analysis of the uh, spinal fluid, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. Uh, we're looking for folks who are 60 to 90 years old and who can have an MRI scan for this study. So really quickly, we'll talk about getting some of the results um, of that CSF sampling. So we do know for uh, folks who have um, the pathology for Alzheimer's disease, they'll have these tau tangles and these amyloid plaques. And you can measure some of these proteins in the spinal fluid that's collected through a lumbar puncture. Um, and if you agree to be in this part of the study, you'll actually get some personalized res personalized results that one of the physicians can go through with you to um, let you know what your risk is uh, based on your uh, biomarker profile. So this is new. We've just started doing this over the last year. And so far it's been really well received. So if you're interested in this type of thing, please, uh, we can let you have, we can give you some more information. Okay. So the next clinical platform or a study that is coming out of the CCNA project is Can Thumbs Up. 
Um, it's a pretty exciting trial because it's completely virtual. So this is the first study that we're doing at Parkwood where all of the visits are taking place virtually. So from learning about the study to signing the consent form to going through some health questionnaires, we're gonna do it all over Zoom. And then the idea is we'd uh, have a couple of visits, we'd ask you some questions, do some cognitive assessments over Zoom. And then everyone is gonna be um, given access to a brain health support program that gives educational modules um, and information on different risk factors and how to modify those risk, risk factors. And then the study would end with more Zoom um, interviews and kind of follow-up questions. So this slide here kind of breaks, um, breaks down that um, Brain Health Pro um, education module that um, I introduced on the other slide. So it's really looking at um, seven modifiable risk factors for your health. And then you can actually go and learn some of these modules. And then um, it can provide a level of risk for each um, factor that you participate in. So overall, there's 181 10 minute chapters that you can kind of go through on um, gradually over the course of a year. Um, it's really innovative, it's exciting, and it's all been developed by Canadian researchers. Um, and then you'll get some email notifications on what you and what you think about some of these modules. So it's really exciting. And I'm hoping that we get a lot of folks who might be interested in something like this. Uh, in addition, you'll actually be able to, um, you'll be mailed some wearable technology that'll monitor things like sleep and activity level. And then you'll actually get a readout of that at the end of the study on uh, what some of those activities look like for you individually. So again, we're looking for folks who might have normal cognition, who have subjective cognitive complaints, or mild cognitive impairment to participate in this study. Um, you have to have access to a computer since it's gonna be done through Zoom and, and Wi-Fi and, um, and a smartphone because you'll be asked to do um, a couple cognitive games on your phone and you'll get reminders to your phone um, to when you need to participate in different activities. So you're eligible to uh, sign up for the study if you're between the ages of 60 and 85 and the study will be completed within one year. And again, all the visits are virtual. Okay, so the next study is um, an Andre study. Um, it's a, a project that we've been running at Parkwood for a couple of years, but uh, we're moving into the second phase of the trial which is mainly being run out of Toronto. Um, and it is also a virtual study and they're calling it the Hands Ontario Study for Health and Aging, Neurodegenerative Diseases and Dementias in Ontario. So we're uh, helping folks get connected with this group from Toronto um, to participate in this virtual study, which is a little bit less intense than the trial that we just talked about, the Can Thumbs Up trial. So basically for this particular trial, Sorry, my slides are moving slowly here. So for this particular trial, um, it's for uh, folks who have a variety of different neurodegenerative diseases, including you know, MCI, ALS, Parkinson's disease, and frontal temporal lobe dementia, as well as, um, again, uh, normal controls as a comparison group. You'll um, meet a coordinator from Toronto that'll go through some health um, history, some clinical questionnaires with you. And then uh, the main focus of the study is some wearable technology. So they're going to mail you some technology that you'll wear, um, kind of like a, an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, if folks are familiar with those types of things. that will give sleep information and um, activity level, and you'll get some feedback on some of those, um, some of those items. Um, in addition for this study, they want you to go to a local lab where there'll be um, someone who can draw some blood for some, um, for some lab samples. So this study doesn't take very long. Um, you get the feedback on your sleep patterns and some of your activity level. And so it's, it's a really neat initiative um, for folks who maybe wanna participate in something, but they might not have a lot of time or they don't wanna do it over a long period of time. And then, so this is kind of, um, uh, when I reached out to the study team yesterday, they get, were able to give me some um, examples of what your feedback will look like. Um, 
So here would be an example for sleep. Uh, so they'll be able to break it down by day and then your pattern throughout the whole night. So this is kind of the individual feedback that you can expect if this was um, a study that you were interested in. So in addition to sleep, they would give you feedback on um, walking, physical activity, and your sedentary behavior. So it's a neat opportunity if it's something that folks are interested in. And then um, another observational study happening at Parkwood is a gait and brain study. Um, so uh, we do know from our gait and brain lab that uh, motor slowing and cognitive slowing are more prevalent as we age and subtle variations in gait while performing um, cognitive tasks may detect older risks, uh, older, sorry, older adults at risk of progression to dementia. So down here in the corner, you can see there's a gentleman and he's just walking on a, on a, what looks like a mat, but it's actually a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment that can actually um, measure your gait and gait variability. And we're always looking for people to participate in these studies and do some tasks while walking um, to help further research in this area. And then our last observational study is actually being run by Dr. Elizabeth Finger, where she's looking to examine um, some uh, cognitive deficits that underline common uh, dementias, such as apathy, and to look at the impact of medications on symptoms of dementia. So this is a study that involves um, an MRI scan and some baseline assessments at Parkwood Hospital, um, and specifically you get to do some um, computer games. Um, so it's a pretty short study. It only lasts three months. Um, and we're really looking at uh, people with a variety of different types of neurodegeneration to participate um, as young as 30 and um, all the way up to the age of 90. So um, if you're interested in this study, our PhD uh, student Ruby would love to hear from you. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We've talked about some observational studies and how you can get involved with those projects. And now we're gonna talk about clinical trials um, and what is a clinical trial. So people might've heard the term randomized controlled um, trial, um, where eligible uh, participants are randomly assigned to one or more group. Um, so this is a trial where one group would receive, one or more group would receive an intervention like a new uh, medication or drug, while the control group would receive a placebo. So something that looked like the real drug, but it actually didn't contain any active ingredients. Um, so the research can study what happens to people in each group and any difference in outcome can be linked to the intervention. And this is really considered the gold standard for producing um, uh, high levels of evidence because little is left to chance. So um, clinical trials for uh, folks with cognitive impairment um, are needed to find new treatments that are both effective and safe. Um, these trials um, are um, medications versus a placebo, like we talked about on the previous slide. And they're also double blind. And what that means is you'd come into the clinic and if you're interested in one of these trials, you'd be assigned to either the placebo arm or a treatment arm. And double blind means that you wouldn't know which arm you're on and neither would the study staff or the study physician. And that way there is no bias. So if you came in and we knew you're on the medication, we might you know, um, administer assessments a little bit differently or we might create bias in how we think you should do based on the, um, the treatment arm that you're in. So if we keep it double blind, then um, there's, no, there's no bias in the results. So the average trial is 18 months, but they do range from six months to six years. So some of these trials can be quite lengthy. And new treatments are administered by mouth, injection, or infusion. And the visits do take place at Parkwood. And I've included a picture of what Parkwood looks like um, in the bottom here in case folks have uh, never seen, um, seen the Parkwood Institute. So when we talk about developing new treatments or new drugs, um, there are different phases of development that drugs have to go through before they can actually be approved. So they start off in preclinical phases um, where you're really looking to see if the drug has the potential to be um, both effective and safe. And then it moves into phase one trial, which is the first in human trial. 
Um, and you're really, your primary goal with those trials is safety. And then it'll move to a phase two trial where we're really looking to find which dose might work, work best um, if, we, if we were looking at multiple doses and also to continue to look at safety. And then in phase three, um, these are large trials where we try to recruit a large number of participants to, to actually show that the drug might work and also that it's safe. And once the phase three trial is complete, if it's a positive trial showing that indeed the drug was effective, they can um, be filed for application to Health Canada or the Food and Drug Administration in the States for approval for the general population to use. And then after um, a, a medication is approved, often there'll be phase four tr uh, trials. These are what we call post-marketing studies where you get large number of people uh, taking the medication and you can start to see you know, some maybe rare side effects that happen that you didn't see in some of the earlier um, trials. So that's how drugs actually go through different phases of development. And if you look at on the far um, right-hand side here, this is you know, how many drugs for any particular condition might be in preclinical and in the different phases of development. And then actually the success rate is usually about 4% where you can see for Alzheimer's disease, this has a, been a hard uh, condition to actually uh, find effective medications for. As you can see, a lot of different medications have gone through these preclinical phases with a fairly low success rate. Um, so we're still working on this, and this is why there are few treatments available um, to date. And this is just another slide. It's very busy, and I don't expect everyone to look at all the details of this slide, but it's basically, basically just showing all of the different medications that are under development for Alzheimer's disease currently. So there are a lot, some are um, for symptomatic treatment, some are disease modifying, and they have different um, uh, ways that they work. So when we talk about symptomatic versus disease modifying, I wanted to touch on that before we kind of got into the specifics of the different trials that are available right now at Parkwood. So if you look at this uh, slide here, you can see that the natural disease course for Alzheimer's disease generally follows this yellow line, okay? Over here on the left, this is a memory score that declines over time. And along the bottom, you can see um, the, diff um, the number of years that go by for progression to happen. So there are some symptomatic treatments that are available. Uh, that folks might know about um, on the market for treatment for, for cognitive issues. And often when people take these medications, they might notice a little boost in memory or they might do a little bit better at first. Um, and then they do still follow that natural disease course though. So it doesn't actually change the course of the disease, although it may help initially with some of the symptoms. So for some of the trials that we're running, we're really looking to find something that might be disease modifying that would follow this orange line here. So, you know, we're not expecting folks uh, memory to improve, but maybe to decline at a slower rate than we would have expected. So that leads into some of the criteria for some of these clinical trials that we're running at Parkwood. So we are looking for individuals that could have normal memory, but might be at high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, folks who might have some subjective complaints, who have mild cognitive impairment, or early Alzheimer's disease. For all of the trials that we run, we do need folks to bring in a study partner. And this is just so that we can get information um, about how things are going at home uh, from, someone, uh, from someone else. We do need um, people to be able to read and write in English, to be able to do some of the standardized testing, um, to have these MRI scans. Um, if you're on any medications, that's okay, but we need them to be stable for usually about 12 weeks before screening with no major psychiatric disorders or uncontrolled medical conditions and no major stroke or recent cancer history. So if we look at what we're trying to target with some of these new treatments, um, we can look at these amyloid plaques and these tau tangles that you may have heard about in some previous um, webinars or that you may have learned um, about through the Alzheimer's Society. So on the left, you have a normal, um, Brain, you have normal brain cells, some normal neurons here. And then over on the right, you can see that you do get these amyloid plaques and these tau tangles. So 
So through research, um, there are different compounds that we're studying that um, are um, antibodies to either tau or amyloid. So basically through either an injection or an infusion, you can receive some am, um, antibodies that might target amyloid plaques or some of um, the tau protein. So let's start off by um, looking at potentially treating some individuals early on in this, uh, in this uh, course of disease. So I'll start by talking about a trial that we've been running uh, for quite some time at Parkwood, which was the very first, what we call secondary prevention trial in Alzheimer's disease, where we really started looking at treating people before they had MCI or dementia that we were able to use some of those images, some of those biomarker images like PET scans to show that they actually had some of those protein changes with amyloid or tau in their brain. And that we started treating them earlier on in, in, um, in the course of the disease. And why is that important? Well, it's important because if you look at this image here, you can see that there are four different individuals here um, that have all had um, some PET imaging. The top row is imaging for amyloid and the bottom row is imaging for tau, those two protein abnormalities that happen um, with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see the three participants to the left all have, if you look at the bottom, have are cognitively normal. So they all have normal memory, but you do start to see as you go to this individual here that you do start to see some changes where you actually start to see through some of the advanced imaging that they already have some changes happening in the brain that would indicate they're gonna have some memory problems versus this person that um, has been diagnosed, uh, diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease. And you can see those changes there. So the idea for some of these trials is that you treat some of these people that have some of these changes in their brain before they actually have any memory deficits. So if we go back to that image of the spectrum of cognitive decline, we have three trials that are targeted at these individuals before they actually have um, uh, deficits on some of their memory tests that would indicate that they have mild cognitive impairment. So the first trial we'll talk about, this is an ad that we were just uh, had approved through our ethics board. So you might see this out in the community, but basically this is called the AHEAD study. Um, and it's looking for folks that potentially have a family history of Alzheimer's disease that would be interested in, in coming in to seeing if they're at risk and potentially receive a treatment if they are indeed at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So this is um, an, uh, deemed the AHEAD study, um, and it's with a monoclonal antibody to amyloid. So we're targeting that amyloid protein for folks that have normal cognition, but they, they may or may not have subjective complaints to go with it. Between the ages of 55 and 80, um, if you are between 55 and 64, you would need to have a risk factor. Um, for example, someone, um, a first degree relative with Alzheimer's disease. The uh, trial runs for 216 weeks, so it's a very uh, lengthy trial, so it does involve some commitment with either monthly infusions or infusions every other week. Um, and we're excited about this trial. We've actually um, had previous experience with this medication in individuals with MCI and Alzheimer's disease, and so we're excited to see that it's moving to this um, stage with folks with normal cognition. Um, so that previous, the head trials starting, we're recruiting people now. So if you're interested, it's something that you can get um, uh, information about today. Uh, we're also looking forward to a trial called um, Skyline, which is with a different medication uh, called Gantanarumab, which is also an antibody to amyloid. Again, looking for folks with normal cognition. The treatment, um, the, the trial is almost the same length, 211 weeks. Uh, this one's a little bit different, though, because it's administered through an injection versus an infusion. And uh, participants will have the option whether they want to have a dose every week or every other week. Um, and with the option of learning how to give um, injections yourself so you can do home, in, home in administration. So it's a nice option for these lengthy trials. And again, we do have experience with this medication at Parkwood. Um, so we're excited to see this medication is now being offered in a slightly different uh, patient population. 
And then I wanted to mention a trial that Dr. Finger is doing for folks that have frontal temporal lobe dementia or at risk for frontal temporal lobe dementia. So this will be for um, a very small number of participants, but it's definitely worth mentioning. So it's for individuals um, who develop frontal temporal um, dementia because of a gene mutation, the PGRN gene mutation. So this, um, so unfortunately patients with this gene mutation only make half of this PGRN protein compared to healthy individuals. And this can lead to damage in brain cells. Um, so uh, there's a clinical trial for folks, um, again, with one of these monoclonal antibodies um, to increase the level of the uh, PGRN uh, protein. So the inclusion criteria for this um, is anyone between the ages of 25 and 85 that would have this gene mutation, which if you're asymptomatic, um, you'd have a blood test to show that you're at risk. And um, uh, there is also the option for people who might already be symptomatic to participate in this particular trial also. Okay, so we've talked about uh, trials that are for individuals who might have normal cognition or have some mild subject, uh, subjective complaints. And now we're going to look at a couple of trials for individuals who have mild cognitive impairment. So they start to slow, uh, they start to score a little bit below normal on some of their cognitive assessments. So what do we have available for, for those individuals? So we have three trials. The first is by Janssen Pharmaceuticals, and it's actually um, another monoclonal antibody, but this time to tau, the other protein change that we were talking about that happens in folks with the underlying cause of um, Alzheimer's disease. And this is given by IV infusion. And it's given every four weeks over the course of four and a half years for individuals between 50 and 80 who have mild cognitive impairment. So we've um, already recruited um, half a dozen individuals at Parkwood on this particular medication. And the trial will be open for recruitment for um, at least until the end of the year. Okay, so the next trial for folks with MCI is a little bit different. Um, it actually looks at um, microglia cells. Microglia are cells um, of the brain that regulate uh, brain development, maintenance of neuronal networks, and injury repair. So there's a medication that's at this point just called AL002, which is given by IV infusion that helps promote um, microglia cells to clear amyloid. Um, so it's a 96 week trial uh, folks can be between the ages of 50 and 85 um, and uh, with a diagnosis of MCI. Sorry, my slides are a little bit delayed here. So I wanted to include, um, there might be some people on the call that have heard of a medication that was approved. Uh, by the FDA in the States called aducanumab that was developed by Biogen Pharmaceuticals. So it did have a po one positive trial and um, they applied to the FDA for approval. And it was approved in the United States uh, for folks who have mild cognitive impairment. It's a antibody to amyloid and it's uh, administered by IV infusion. Um, and it has not been improved it, but in Canada yet. Um, and um, we won't know for some time if it will be, but um, the FDA, because they only had one trial that was uh, showed a signal that the medication was positive or that it actually worked, has um, recommended that they complete another large phase three trial. And uh, so it does sound like that is gonna happen and that uh, Canada will be recruiting for this uh, trial in 2023. So this is exciting for anyone who's heard about this in the news. And if they're looking to get involved with this type of, um, with this particular medication, then you can reach out to us. And we anticipate sometime in early next year, we'll have this available uh, in still research, uh, in the research phase. So I just thought I'd talk about what some of the trial results for that particular medication showed. So you can see here that, um, the, there are four different uh, participants shown on this slide. 
the, the one on the top was um, on placebo and the, the three that followed towards the bottom were all on a different um, dose of the medication. And you can see that the, um, that the participants uh, on the left-hand side here, this was their baseline scan. So the scan before they actually received the medication. And then on the left-hand side, you can see that these were their scans after one year of treatment. So you can see in the individuals that were on the medication that they did have clearing of amyloid. So this was very exciting finding and people are excited about some of this, um, some of this initial, these initial findings. Um, and this leads into my next slide where, you know, it's great if you can clear amyloid, but what does this mean for people's memory and functioning? So this is a very busy slide. I don't expect people to actually follow along, but just the take home message is if you look at these different graphs here, the first two are memory scores, and you can see that um, the different colors represent the different doses of the medication with the gray line representing um, the placebo group. So you can see here for the first memory score, where as people become more impaired, their memory score declines, that the people, um, the individuals that were on the high dose and the purple actually were able to do better on their memory scores than the people on the low dose or the placebo, which um, following, leading into this next uh, graph here, with um, folks, um, this memory score here, um, the higher the score, the worse folks did cognitively. So you can see again, that the people on the, uh, on the purple arm, on the high dose arm, did a little bit better than the people um, on the low dose or the placebo. And then this last graph rec represents actually activities of daily living, so functioning. So people, again, in purple, tended to do better at the end of the study than the people in placebo. So it, um, so this medication, it was exciting. It showed that you were actually able to remove amyloid from the brain and then people actually um, appeared to do um, a bit better. Um, this has to be replicated with another trial and that's why we're gonna be doing one next year, but some exciting initial results for sure. So going back again to our graph here, um, our, uh, sorry, our spectrum of cognitive decline. And now we're gonna look a little bit further on to some trials that we have for folks who might have um, uh, Alzheimer's disease or some vascular uh, cognitive impairment here. So the first uh, trial that we'll talk about is for individuals who have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And this trial is a little bit different where it's actually an oral medication um, and the compound actually works by restoring uh, the shape and function of specific brain proteins um, that prevent brain cell um, uh, inflammation and degeneration. So that is how this, tip, this medication works, which is a little bit different than the ones we've talked about in previous slides. Uh, the age range for this trial is 50 to 87. And uh, although this study is 76 weeks, there's only 10 visits. So it's a little bit less onerous than some of the other trials um, as there's fewer study visits. So if you're interested, we can definitely um, uh, give you some information on this one. And then we are running a trial actually uh, for folks with frontal temporal uh, dementia who might have some deficits in empathy and have some uh, issues with apathy. Uh, so it's actually with a medication called oxytocin and it's actually given as a nasal spray. And, um, oops, sorry, everyone. Uh, so the first stage of the study is complete. Um, and the second stage here is what we're enrolling for. So folks will be assigned to either get the oxytocin or the placebo with an interesting study design where there'll be a washout period. And then the folks who were given the oxytocin will then receive placebo. And the folks that were given placebo will be then given oxytocin. So everyone will have an opportunity to take the medication. And then the last trial that I'm going to talk about is actually a trial for folks who might have vascular MCI. So this is exciting because there's currently no treatments approved by Health Canada for this condition, and we don't always see a lot of research in this area. Um, so the treatment being studied here is remote ischemic conditioning, or called RIC, and this aims to increase blood flow to the brain. 
So it involves daily sessions where potential participants, people who want to participate in the study, will use a device to inflate blood pressure cuff around your arm to a pressure sufficient to reduce blood flow for five minutes, followed by a break. And the idea behind this would be that by um, inducing this brief period of cutting off your blood flow in an organ, your arm that's remote from your brain, it may condition your brain to increase blood flow and make the brain less vulnerable to problems like new little strokes. Um, so the trial is, includes four visits over three months and will be um, completed at home. So if this is something you're interested in, it's a trial that is just starting up um, and it would be a great opportunity for folks who might be interested. So I wanted to include a slide, what do you need to know? So some common questions I get asked uh, about uh, from individuals who might be interested in participating in research. So the first question I get asked a lot about is the visit schedule. When do I have to come in? How often do I have to come in? Um, so we do try to accommodate everyone when you um, enroll in a, in a trial to try to keep things standardized. They have a very specific schedule that they want folks to come in on. That being said, we do try to work with everyone to accommodate uh, different schedules, different time of day appointments. And so we can work with you um, with visit schedules. I do wanna just highlight that when we talk about the PET imaging and the MRI imaging, that's not completed at Parkwood Institute. And um, those images, um, th those imaging uh, centers are offsite at St. Joe's Main and at Roberts Research Institute. So you will, you can expect to go off site to those um, other facilities. Um, and then the open label extension. So often these trials, I didn't talk about it when we were introducing each individual trial, but often there'll be an open label extension at the end of those lengthy trials. So when the double blind study portion is complete, um, everyone would be offered the drug as an open label extension. Um, so we still won't know whether you were someone who was on the drug initially or not, but um, it's a way to give everyone an opportunity to receive the treatment while this study um, continues uh, to close and uh, the data continues to be analyzed. And we can talk about which trials that applies for um, if you're interested in, the, in a specific trial. Uh, reimbursement, we, also, we often get uh, asked about questions about reimbursement. So we can reimburse folks for out-of-pocket expenses such as parking and travel. Um, and so we can, uh, and that'll be laid out in the letter of information uh, describing the trial. So here's just a quick summary of all of the trials that we um, talked about today. So there was a lot of them. Um, the trials are very specific depending on uh, where individuals fall on the spectrum of cognitive decline. Um, with our observational studies along the bottom here that apply to almost all categories. Oh, I forgot one there. So just in summary, um, uh, from what we've covered today, so we introduced um, research for cognitive impairment, discussed why it's important to participate in research, defined different types of research projects, specifically also um, observational um, studies and clinical trials, and explored how you can participate in research locally if you're interested. So here's my last slide, and it acknowledges our very large team. Um, as I'm sure everyone's learned from this presentation, there's a lot of research happening, and it takes a large team of individuals to make it happen. Um, so thanks to everyone who helped me put these slides together and to our whole team. Um, also, we have a phone number here at the top you can contact if you're interested, as well as an email address and my own email address if you have any specific questions for me. So thanks again, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you so much, Sarah, for such an informative and helpful presentation. To our attendees, I am sure you have many thoughts and questions after hearing from Sarah. We have approximately 10 minutes or so, um, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Just a friendly reminder to please put all questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. 
And if you see a question that is in the Q&A box that is uh, similar to what you want to ask, we do have the upvote feature. So just click on that little thumbs up uh, feature and it'll get moved right up onto the um, on, on the list. So I'm just going to stop the share so we can see Sarah better and get a better visual of everybody. Hi, Sarah. I have to say, I really appreciated the way you presented the presentation. It was um, for somebody who's like me, who has zero clinical background, was incredible helpful and really appreciated how you broke down um, everything and what, uh, you know, what the, the different phases meant, et cetera. So thank you for the clarifications for that. Yeah. So we're going to start off with uh, the first question. And it says, I'm assuming there would be counseling offered in the AHEAD study if the risk was found to be high. Yeah. So we do have a whole process around disclosure and how we disclose information to individuals. Um, and so it's uh, very protocol specific. So for that particular trial, we ask questions pre, so for that particular trial, folks would be enrolled that would have a positive PET scan for amyloid. So you would go through um, some memory testing. And if you meet um, some of the uh, early, the early criteria, you go ahead and you'd have a PET scan and it would either be positive or negative. And one thing I always like to mention in these um, sessions is that, um, you know, the, the drug companies have very specific cut points for positive and negative uh, for PET scans. So let's say they, they, they pick 50% positivity um, as a random example for a cut point for inclusion in the trial. You'd be included with 51 per, if you were 51% positive, but you'd be excluded if you were 49% negative, right? With only, you know, the difference of two points on that scale, if, if that makes sense. And so we won't be able to give you that specific information about how positive or how negative you are uh, for a particular trial uh, in, terms of, in terms of your relative risk, but we will be able to just give you like uh, your, your scan was negative or positive, and then there'd be some counseling around what that means. Thank you, Sarah. The next question, do folks respond to each study individually or is there a triage that aligns people to the appropriate study? Can mm. people participate in more than one study? Mm, great question. So um, the, the first part of the question about whether you can apply to be in an individual study or just uh, um, ask to be in a study in particular. So we do have people who call who you know may have heard on the news or in one of our talks about a very specific trial that for whatever reason, they're very interested in participating. And so we can go through some medical history to see if indeed that trial fits uh, for if that's a good fit for you. And if it is, then by all means, then we'll, we'll go through some assessments to see if you're a good candidate. Um, because the trials have very specific inclusion exclusion criteria, which means each trial has a series of um, criteria that people need to meet to be included. For example, you know, if someone had high blood pressure, they wouldn't want to put them in a trial until the blood pressure was was treated and was in the normal range. So we go through different uh, types of medical history to make sure that uh, folks are a good candidate. Um, so generally people just reach out to us and ask and say, hey, we're interested in research. Um, can we, what research trial might I be a good fit for? And that's the majority of the cases. But if there was something that you were interested in as an individual, reach out and we can let you know whether it would uh, be a good fit or not. And then in terms of whether um, you can participate in more than one trial, um, we often get people who will participate in an observational trial like the CAN Thumbs Up or the Compass ND trial, and then go ahead and participate in a randomized control trial for a treatment. Um, and there are cases where you can do both, yes. Um, you wouldn't be able to be in two treatment trials at once, but there are some of those observational trials that you could participate in. And then you could also participate in a treatment trial, and then you can sometimes participate in two observation, observational trials at once. So for example, if you wanted to participate in that Compass ND trial that I was talking about, where you kind of come in over five visits, see um, either one of the cognitive neurologists or the geriatricians, have some um, uh, clinical questionnaires answered and some cognitive assessments done, you might also want to participate in the virtual study, which is similar but different. And you could definitely do both. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. 
So the next question is something I know that you and I have discussed. Would it be possible for people to receive a list, maybe quarterly, of all of the research opportunities available? Um, and I'm going to expand this a little bit further, even specifically to all the ones that you actually spoke about uh, mm. today, so that people uh, can actually, we can maybe uh, do a resource page, perhaps, that might be helpful. We can perhaps add it with the presentation as well. So. Yes, so that's just, definitely possible. We are working on revamping our website, um, so I can give um, that link and uh, to folks too. Um, it's not super up to date with the current research, but just kind of a, it's, at this point, it's just a general overview of our research in general. Um, so, but yes, we can email um, out a list of studies and some basic criteria for who might be a good fit for each of those studies. Wonderful, thank you. Would it be possible for people to receive, oh, sorry, I just did that, sorry, my apologies. Um, what are the geog geographical boundaries for these research projects? For example, if there are individuals interested in Waterloo area. Yeah, no, so there's no boundaries. Anyone can participate. Uh, for the virtual study, actually, we're hoping to get some people from other provinces for the first time, which is kind of neat. And to um, as long as they have good Wi-Fi and they have the technology to connect, we're hoping to really reach some more even remote populations. So that's exciting. In terms of um, travel from Windsor or Waterloo or Hamilton or Brantford, um, we have folks who participate in um, even some of the really intense clinical trials from those areas. And um, we reimburse for their travel or, you know, in some, we've had a participant from Hamilton, um, actually, sorry, I'm mistaken from Brantford, who we've actually had come in on train. So we've arranged um, them to come to and from um, their home by train and then have a taxi to and from their home and then to and from our clinic back to the train station. So we're able to work with uh, folks to make sure that um, uh, geographic location isn't a barrier to participating if that's something that you want to do. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. In genetic counseling offered to people when interested in decide in interested in slash deciding whether to participate in the trials related to genetics. Sorry, agents. Is there genetic counseling? Sorry, I misread that. My apologies. Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. So at this particular time point, so I'm going to address this kind of in, in two different ways. So in the past, we have run trials where we've only included people who, for example, might have like an at-risk um, gene. Uh, so some people might have heard of the APOE gene, which can be either an APOE 2, 3, or 4. And folks who might have an APOE 4 gene may be at higher risk for developing cognitive impairment. In the past, we have done some uh, pre and post genetic counseling uh, from some of the clinicians at Parkwood. Um, to address those issues as we go through the, uh, oper the, the potential for enrolling into those trials. At this point, though, we're not disclosing that information, the genetic information, and folks are being included into the studies based on whether or not they have a positive PET scan or a positive biomarker, for example, in the, um, in the CSF through lumbar puncture. So we do go through um, uh, amyloid disclosure and what that means if you were to have amyloid or tau either on a PET scan or through your CFS re CSF results and what that means, um, which is a little bit different than genetic counseling. Um, uh, no one on site is a, is a genetic counselor, um, but um, the clinicians will give... Um, uh, disclosure based on amyloid positivity or not, or tau positivity or not, and what that might mean. And that does happen at Parkwood in the clinic, yes. Thank you, Sarah. If people don't have a family physician or primary care provider, can they still enroll in clinical trials? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's not a problem at all. For folks who do have a family physician, we'll ask participants if we can send letters back to the family physician. Um, uh, with updates, you know, specifically around some lab work or, or, or imaging results. If you don't, that's fine. You don't actually need to be referred to research. You can be self-referred to research department. Thank you, Sarah. 
I'm curious about what Sarah knows about insurance implications and genetic risk of dementia. Right, so um, that is a great question. Uh, and I'm not well versed in insurance. So um, I'm gonna leave my uh, answer pretty vague. At this point, none of the specific clinical trials will actually um, disclose genetic information. Um, but I do know that earlier this, it was actually in December of 2021, Dr. Elizabeth Finger and um, uh, another um, clinician genetic counselor who I'm blanking on um, the name, but it'll come to me as we continue talking, gave an excellent talk on genetic risk. And um, I know that that particular talk is posted on the Alzheimer's disease, uh, the Alzheimer's Society website in their Brain Matters series. And it has a lot of great information, but if you reach out to me um, with um, specific questions, I can try to find the, the answers. Thank you, Sarah. And actually you're speaking to that webinar. We do have that posted and I can certainly share that information with people if they're interested. Oh, great. Okay. It, that was definitely the folks who are the experts. It's less my area of expertise. Yes. Uh, thank you for your very informative presentation. You mentioned screening. Could you speak more about screening, please? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever someone wants to come into a trial, we go through what we call like a screening visit or a screening process. So you can imagine that, for example, um, the AHEAD trial, right, for someone who has normal cognition, potentially some subjective complaints, but really does score normally on those cognitive assessments. So a screening visit, you'd come in and you'd have those cognitive assessments done. Um, I'm actually the one who does the cognitive assessments for that particular trial, so it makes it easy. So I would sit down, we'd go through some cognitive assessments to see if you score in what we would consider um, that normal range for the, the trial um, has set out. You'd have some lab work to make sure that all your lab work is normal, an MRI scan to make sure there was nothing uh, that uh, is found on the MRI scan that could uh, explain why later on you might have a problem with cognition. Um, so you do a series of assessments and tests, and if they come back um, in a pre-specified way to be, you know, quote unquote, normal for proceeding, then you would proceed um, into the trial. Uh, the last step for these trials is to get that PET scan. Um, again, just, you know, kind of positive or negative on whatever their, their, um, the scale is for a particular drug company that has uh, set up that particular um, trial. Um, and then that would be like a screening process. And then if you kind of meet all that criteria and then you would be eligible to get the drug. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. So I know we're just over uh, one o'clock. So we just have uh, like one or two more. The, the next one is related to health insurance, which you just spoke to. So we're not gonna, I'm gonna leave that one alone. Um, and, oh, there was another question there. I'm not sure. I think actually that might be it then. I think that's it. If anyone else has any other last minute questions that they want to throw in, now's your last chance. No. Okay. Well, okay. we're happy to answer any questions that might come up after this call too. I know I'm sorry. I think sometimes I talk very quickly and I went through a lot of information on a lot of slides to kind of leave some time for the question and answer. So, you know, if you're sitting this afternoon and a question pops up and you thought, oh, shoot, I should have asked that question, feel free to send me an email or reach out and we, we can um, try our best to answer any questions that anyone on the call might have. So Sarah, we're getting some great comments and everyone's saying thank you for such a great presentation. Um, so I'm just being mindful of time here for everyone. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen again here so we can carry on. So again, Sarah, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule today and for, to present your knowledge and your expertise with us. Uh, very well received and, and very well presented. Really appreciate that. I know that your presentation is going to stimulate further discussion amongst people. Uh, to our attendees, uh, thank you so much for attending this month's Brain Matters uh, webinar. And before uh, you leave, if you could just hang on with me for a couple of minutes, I just have a couple of things I'd like to uh, mention to you. 
So on Saturday, uh, May the 28th, when we will be hosting our Walk for Alzheimer's event, it's back. So we will be offering the walk in a hybrid format uh, with both in-person and virtual options to participate in. And you can register uh, going directly to our website uh, or you can call our office to receive a, a registration package. So our next Brain Matters webinar is actually going to resume in the fall. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for ending our webinar series uh, for this round on such a great positive note with such uh, wonderful opportunities available locally. Uh, keep an eye on our website and the Education Zone for upcoming details for further webinars. And again, um, before you leave, lastly, I just uh, would ask that as you exit, uh, to please complete a short evaluation uh, when you leave the webinar today. It should pop up as soon as you hit the leave button there on the screen that you see, or you can, you can scan the QR code that's on the screen with your, uh, using your camera on your phone to access the evaluation. And then thank you again for attending this webinar today. Enjoy the rest of the day and stay safe. We look forward to seeing you again in future webinars. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon.